So welcome everyone to the Sadhguru Center speaker series. My name is Tulsi Chase and I'm the head of education and outreach at the Sadhguru Center. In this series, we present lectures and discussions highlighting the research and explorations of our multidisciplinary community of scientists, global experts and thought leaders. And we welcome you all to our first speaker series of this year. So just a little bit about our center for those who might be joining us for the very first time. We are a multidisciplinary research center based at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, which is in Boston, Massachusetts, USA. And our work is at the nexus of education, outreach, and research. Uh, a lot of our work is actually focused on looking at different meditation practices and their impacts on health and well-being and quality of life for both patients as well as the public. And so we're really excited to invite you all today for a talk on one such advanced meditation program called Samyama, um, where two of our incredible community members who are scientists uh, and specialists in neuroimaging have been researching the impacts of this particular program on mental health and different aspects of brain structure and function. And we'll be sharing a little bit more about their research on this particular program today. So just as a, um, an overview, Dr. Kestas is um, an assistant professor of anesthesia at Harvard Medical School and the Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care and Pain Medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Prior to his current position, he was assistant professor of radiology at the Martino Center for Mi Biomedical Imaging at Massachusetts General Hospital, and also the director of vision neurodynamics laboratory. Mm -hmm. He is a vision neuroscientist with interests ranging from the role of top-down predictions in vision to neural dynamics and connectivity underlying meditation. He brings expertise in the domains of MRI, MEG, EEG, eye tracking, visual and threat perception, and functional neuroanatomy. Dr. Kivaraga is also the editor of a volume on computational and neuroscientific approaches to understanding visual scene perception which was in Scene Vision published by the MIT Press in 2014, and also the recipient of NIH K01 and R01 awards. Uh, and jo joining him today to share about uh, this really exciting research is Dr. Ramana Vishnubotla, who is a neuroimaging scientist at Indiana University Medical School. He received his PhD in bioengineering from the University of Illinois at Chicago. His current work involves magnetic resonance imaging or MRI processing for both structural and functional, functional MR images. Two major tracks of his research include assessing the impact of prenatal opioid exposure on the infant brain and assessing the impact of meditation on the neurological and neuroendocrine systems. Dr. Vishnu Bhotla has practiced daily yoga and meditation for over 18 years and has been actively involved with delivering meditation practices to a worldwide audience for over seven years. So welcome doctors Kivaraga and Vishnu Potla. the floor is yours. Hello and thank you for joining us. All right, thanks everyone. Um, it's great to see so many people here today. Um, so yeah, why don't we get started as uh, Tulsi mentioned. Um, I'm uh, Ramana Vishnubodla, and um, we'll be discussing um, the presentation about the meditating brain. Um, Kestis, did you want to introduce yourself real quick? So <clears throat> I was introduced already by, by Tulsi, but uh, like I said, I'm a visual neuroscientist who in the past year has become interested in meditation. And uh, we've done a study in collaboration with Ramana on this, and I also study it using EG. So back to you, Ramana. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, so depression and anxiety are major problems uh, throughout the world, especially in the United States, where it's estimated over 17 million people um, have at least a one major depressive episode. Uh, this number represents over 7% of all U.S. adults in 2017. 
Generalized anxiety disorder affects almost 7 million adults or about 3% of the US population. Now, this is worse over the past two years since the pandemic began as these numbers have escalated. So we're looking at meditation as a way to um, decrease the impact of anxiety and depression on, uh, on these uh, ailments. So, um, so here, if we look at this graph, we can see real quickly that um, in 2019, we saw symptoms of anxiety and depression around 11%. But we see as the pandemic started and as it uh, escalated, the percentage of people who were saying that they had symptoms of anxiety and depression increased dramatically. So if you look at um, towards the end of December, 2020, we see that over 40% of the population has uh, um, some form of anxiety or depression. So meditation can be a way of dealing with anxiety or depression. Now we've seen that meditation has become popular um, and it's been seen in popular culture for the past few generations. However, we need to have a better idea of how meditation can help us in both the clinical aspects as well as the uh, understanding how it works physiologically. So here, um, we talked about how meditation has been there for a few generations, at least in the Western world. But actually, if you look at the world as a whole, meditation has been around for thousands of years. So the Yoga Sutras, which is an ancient text on meditation and yoga, describes eight limbs or branches of yoga. These include Yama, which is um, ethical standards, Niyama, which is uh, adherences, Asanas, which is postures, Pranayama, which is a uh, breath control, Pratyahara, which is a sense of withdrawal, Dharana, which is concentration, and Dhyana, which is meditation, and finally Samadhi, which is union. Now, a combination of these final three limbs, dharana, jhana, and samadhi, is an advanced process that we call samyama. So in 2018, um, we were fortunate to have a samyama retreat conducted in the United States in the state of Tennessee. So we contacted those who've registered for samyama, and we looked at, at four different time points. Two months before samyama, um, right before Samyama, right after Samyama, and three months after Samyama. For, two, uh, for uh, the two months before Samyama, leading up to Samyama, participants were asked to do uh, rigorous uh, preparation steps, which includes yoga, as well as um, a restrictive 50% vegan diet. So we asked uh, survey questions for all four time points. And what we've seen here is when we're looking at anxiety and depression, those with baseline anxiety had uh, actually during the preparation process, they were able to get below the cutoff. As we can see in these graphs, these dotted lines represent the cutoffs for both anxiety and depression. So these people were able to go below the cutoff um, for both anxiety and depression, and they were able to maintain that uh, over the course, course of the intervention and after the follow-up of uh, three months post-meditation. So other metrics we looked at were joy and vitality. Um, for joy, we see that at the baseline versus uh, the, you know, right before meditation and right after the uh, program. We say that there's an increase in joy, and then we see a similar aspect with vitality. Now, with joy, um, when we looked at three months uh, follow up from the uh, program, we see that there's a slight increase in joy. With vitality, there's a slight decrease. However, um, it's still more than uh, what it was uh, before the uh, meditation program. And for mindfulness and resilience, we see the same trend where there's a increase all the way up to uh, the program and after the program. After uh, three months, um, there's a slight decrease, but it's still above, uh, before, you know, it's still 
more than uh, what it was at the baseline and before they uh, took some ammo. So now we're looking at these psychological factors. Let's take a deeper look at what, what really might be happening here. And the way we're gonna be taking a deeper look is through using neuroimaging te techniques, uh, specifically uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. So fMRI, what it involves is uh, detecting signal of uh, oxygen, oxygen, oxygenated blood. And from this signal, we can see like where which regions of the brain are, are potentially active. When we're looking at um, different regions, there are certain regions that work together. And these regions that work together refer to something called brain networks. So here we have um, a picture with the world map. And it's showing um, the energy usage in the world. So we see that um, the areas in yellow, these depict areas which are using a high amount of energy. So why this is important for this presentation is because MRI kind of works in a similar way where we have the whole brain, but there's certain areas which are using more energy or have more oxygenated blood than others. So for these regions, they show up differently and this is how we detect the signal. So does uh, anyone have any questions on MRI? Are we uh, good to go for the next section? Okay. So now we talked about MRI, we're gonna get a little more about brain networks. So what are brain networks? So brain networks are a group of, uh, group of regions which are functionally connected through statistical correlation of output signal. So for this study, we'll be looking at four brain networks, the fault mode network, the salience network, fronto, the frontoparietal network, and the dorsal attention network. Okay. So these four are just um, some of the networks. So we, in this slide, we're seeing that there's many other networks. Um, here we're seeing 13 different networks of which we chose four. Uh, due to the relevance uh, for our study, as well as having the distinct anatomical regions. So the first network we'll be looking at is the default mode network. So this involves reflective processes, such as wakeful rest, mind wandering, and rumination. So there's four regions here uh, that we'll highlight, uh, which are the posterior singlet cortex, uh, which is in the back, the percunius, which is right uh, above the posterior singlet cortex, uh, the medial frontal cortex, which is uh, basically front and center, and uh, angular, gyrus, gy angular, angular gyrus, which are two of them, which is on, uh, the, in the back, each side of the brain. So for the posterior cingulate cortex, um, it's highlighted in green here. Um, it's, it, can, it sits right on top of the corpus callosum and it's involved with recalling memories. And it could also be involved with balancing internal and external attention. However, this region still needs to be better understood. So the second brain network we'll look at is a salience network. So the salience network, it's involved with filtering and prioritizing signals from external cues. It's also used for switching between uh, activation of the frontoparietal network or the default mode network. So two prominent regions of the salience network include the anterior cingulate cortex and the insula, which are shown here on the side. So the anterior cingulate cortex, which is yellow here, um, as its name suggests, it's, um, it's in front of the posterior cingulate cortex uh, sitting on top of the corpus callosum. And it's involved with attention, reward anticipation, decision-making, and ethics and morality. 
Um, it connects with both the limbic system, which is the central part of the brain, and the prefrontal cortex, which is this frontal portion of the brain. And it has an important role in both consciousness and registering pain. So the third network we'll be looking at is the frontal parietal network, which is also known as a central executive network. Uh, so here we'll be looking, so this network involves uh, with executive functions, such as working memory, problem solving, self-control, and goal-oriented behaviors. <coughs> Sorry. So there's two regions here to look at, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the postal parietal cortex. <clears throat> so these three networks, basically, uh, um, Kestas, did you want to explain this slide real quick? Yeah, so um, uh, can you hear me okay? One. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the important thing to note about, as, as Raman already mentioned about the brain, is it's not a single region or even a couple of regions doing one thing. It's networks of regions uh, interacting with other networks. And uh, Raman already covered the uh, default mode network and the salience network. The, uh, the central executive or the frontal parietal network is. Uh, one of uh, so-called intrinsic control networks. And they're involved in um, those areas in the, uh, in the central executive network are involved in goal-directed control and uh, flexible interaction and mediation of other networks. So one example for, uh, is, for example, you're driving um, and you notice that you're drifting out of your lane and you self-correct uh, steer back into your lane. So that's one, uh, one example of it. And as we'll see, that's, that's important in the process of meditation as it is the network that actually coordinates uh, the default mode network and, this, uh, and other networks as well. Uh, Ramana, if you wanna, um, do, are, you, are you good to go yeah. back? So the fourth network we'll be looking at is the dorsal attention network. So this is involved with voluntary control of attention, particularly visual attention. And there's two uh, main regions in the dorsal attention network. The intraparietal sulcus, which, which is here on the left, and the frontal fields, which is here on the right. <clears throat> Sorry, I think I lost my voice. <coughs> Fill so, if, uh, if you need no, to. No, no, it's fine. Okay, great. Um, just trying to get my voice back. I don't know what happened all of a sudden. So uh, we're looking at uh, multiple experimental conditions. Um, so basically, we have two time points um, right before and right after Salima, and two task conditions. Uh, the resting state, which is basically, um, you know, just a normal state, not really doing anything. And a focused breathing condition. And we, we have two participant groups, uh, the Samyama participants and those who did not participate in Samyama. <coughs> so if we're looking at our demographics here, we have 13 meditators and only four controls. And in, amongst the meditators, we have more males than females. Another thing that's important to consider is our controls weren't age matched. So they're considerably older than our meditators. And that's something to take into account um, when looking at the results. <clears throat> so, um, Ramana, may I add something? If you yeah. go back to the previous slide, this is Bala. I just want to add something to it. So, we had two sites at the time of recruitment. One was Beth Israel Dignes Medical Center and the other was IU. So um, <clears throat> this data is only from the uh, Indiana University participants. 
we had actually planned to have more people in the study and we really had um, i believe 20 from each site like 10 meditators and 10 controls the problem we had was um because we had two sets right pre and post there are a number of participants who were pre did not turn up for the post measurements so that was one problem and the controls also didn't show up for the post measurements so going forward when we plan for larger studies we just if there are meditators in this call we just pray and uh, plead with you that you know if you sign up for a study please make sure that you can complete the study otherwise you'll end up with this uh, numbers <clears throat> you know otherwise it would have been a very powerful study uh, as ramana would proceed to talk about the results thank you for this uh, note i just wanted to mention that there go ahead ramana oh thanks bala and you mentioned some important points so yeah um our first set of results we're looking at the meditators uh, and we'll, you know, in panel A, we'll first look at the, uh, the resting state. And what we found here is that um, the functional connectivity between the salience and default mode networks actually increased, um, particularly in the, uh, between the anterior and posterior cingulate gyrus or anterior cingulate cortex. So on the other hand, when we're looking at the focused breathing conditions, we can see that um, the functional connectivity within each of these networks, uh, the salience and default mode networks, actually uh, decreases. And here we see that the false discovery rate um, is less than 0 0.05, and that's what's considered significant. <clears throat> so now we're gonna be comparing meditation, meditators versus controls um, for both task conditions, as well as both time points. So um, for meditators at the resting state before the program, they had lower connectivity within the uh, dorsal, <coughs> the dorsal uh, attention network. However, when we looked at focused breathing, there was no significant difference between uh, meditators and controls. Now, if we look after the program, meditators had lower connectivity between the dorsal attention network and the central ex executive network. network which can be seen in panel C. Finally, uh, focus breathing after the program, meditators had lowered connectivity between the default mode networks and dorsal attention networks and default mode networks and central executive network. So finally, um, we looked at uh, how um, connectivity correlated with psychological scores. And uh, what we found is we looked at all the metrics that we looked at uh, earlier in the presentation, like anxiety, depression, joy, vitality, mindfulness, and resilience. And we, we saw that mindfulness was the only metric with, uh, with significance to um, functional connectivity. And here we saw that there's in increased functional connectivity within the salience network. So to summarize the data, the psychological metrics improved with preparation and participation in the Samima program. So we've seen that meditators had increased fu functional connectivity between the default mode and uh, salience networks in the resting state. On the other hand, meditators had decreased functional connectivity within each of these networks, um, default mode and salience networks, uh, for the focused breathing condition. And finally, um, we saw that there, there was increased fun, uh, functional connectivity within the CMS network, and this was linked with mindfulness. So now um, Kestis is also going to speak a little more about uh, brain networks and uh, meditation. Thank you, Ramana. So um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, uh, these functional brain networks interact all the time, and including during meditation. So the question is, what happens actually uh, when people meditate? And one model is that um, uh, it involves several networks um, during the process. So for example, you're doing focused attention meditation, uh, and you're maintaining uh, the attention on the object or process, such as breathing of meditation. 
and you find yourself mind wandering, especially if you're a, sort of a novice uh, meditator as I am, you become aware of mind wandering and then you try to refocus back on the object or process of meditation. So some of the networks that are putatively involved uh, in this process, next slide, please. Uh, so the focus attention on meditation is thought to involve uh, the frontal parietal or, or central executive network that Raman already talked about briefly. And that's maintaining control over your uh, object or uh, process of meditation. When you start mind wandering, your default mode network or DMN becomes more activated. Then when you become aware uh, that you're mind, mind wandering during meditation, the salience network, including the uh, anterior cingulate cortex and the insula, uh, notice that they're involved in monitoring both extrinsic and intrinsic interoceptive cues. And then um, the central executive or FPC, the frontal parietal network becomes involved again, uh, refocusing your attention on meditation. Sort of like in, in the example I gave earlier about driving your car and drifting out of your lane and then drifting back into the, or steering back into your lane. So um, that's, we can talk a little more about it during discussion, but let me move on to uh, next, next slide, uh, please, uh, Ramana. So uh, one interesting question uh, of what happened. So uh, let me say this. So even though we're discussing an fMRI paper on meditation, MRI is actually far from an ideal environment <clears throat> to study meditation because of the supine position, which is mostly unsuitable for meditation. And of course, the, the loud noise is generated by the scanner. So EG or MEG is a lot better suited for meditation studies, but has a low spatial resolution compared to fMRI. Uh, and the main strength of EG is its high temporal resolution, which can inform us about the temporal and spectral properties uh, of the brain uh, under meditation, but it's difficult to link it to the, to the brain anatomy. So there's very, very few studies that uh, have used both EEG and fMRI to understand both the spatial and the temporal aspects of meditation and what networks might be involved. So let me talk about a couple of those studies. Um, so one, uh, actually go back one slide. So one study is a case study of this expert meditation uh, with over 40 years of meditation experience, including over 20 years as a resident uh, Buddhist monk um, and meditation teacher. Uh, so he was um, scanned in fMRI while also being recorded with EEG. And these are, these are very difficult studies to do actually um, because of uh, the noise involved and, and whatnot. Um, so in any case, this meditator being a highly, highly advanced meditator was able to achieved uh, a state of what the authors called content uh, free awareness uh, towards the end of his meditation session. So let me talk about uh, what they found. Um, so next slide, Ramana, please. So um, what they found was that uh, as in other fMRI studies, uh, the default mode network, the mind wandering network was suppressed uh, in this expert meditator. And it was correlated with uh, decreased alpha band power. Uh, alpha band is eight to 12 Hertz, the biggest, the strongest um, oscillation in the brain. Um, and then the increased theta power, which is three to seven Hertz approximately. And both of these have been noted in separate uh, EG studies uh, of meditators, both the increased uh, frontal theta power and the increased, uh, decreased alpha power. Um, and this was linked to the, uh, the connectivity between the door, uh, default mode net, uh, network and the dorsal attention network. The dorsal attention network is, uh, is the network that monitors uh, external cues uh, that Ramana already talked about. Okay, so let me, uh, so uh, yeah, let me move on to the next one because we're kind of short on time, I think. Uh, 
Yeah, we're short on time. So uh, <clears throat> another study um, was looking at what uh, EG power changes correlate uh, with the activity of resting state networks and fMRI. So in this case, this wasn't a meditation study, but it was uh, patients with implanted uh, cortical surface electrodes. And they had their electrical activity recorded, uh, which is a very uh, good, much cleaner signal than EEG, um, while they were being scanned with fMRI. So what they found was that uh, the theta band power correlated with uh, the activity um, of the intr intrinsic networks, so the default mode network and the uh, central executive network. You can see that in uh, on the right in panel A, you can see a peak in the theta band between four and eight, and that's correlated in the C panel uh, with the activity of uh, default mode, mode and frontal parietal control uh, network or some central executive network. The alpha band power. Um, Conversely, which you can see in, uh, in blue, shades of blue, you see a peak between eight and 12, uh, correlated with the extrinsic networks, um, somatosensory and dorsal attention networks. Uh, so that those two studies um, shed some light on how EG activity correlates and is related to uh, the fMRI uh, studies and meditators. And particularly, particularly the, uh, those looking at the uh, network connectivity. Um, okay, next slide. We have about five minutes, I think. Okay, so um, let me briefly talk about the relevance of these findings to psychopathology and health, uh, in particular with regard to the default mode network. So, default mo mode network or DMN hyperactivity and hyperconnectivity has been observed in anxiety and depression and schizophrenia, and is believed uh, to lead to rumination, excessive sort of negative thinking in both anxiety, anxiety and depression. And uh, in schizophrenia, uh, there's sort of an excessive internal focus on internal sensations uh, and ignoring of external cues in favor of the internal uh, sensations. So I think uh, that training the mind as is done in meditation to suppress the DMN or at least shape it in, uh, in sort of a uh, constructive way uh, may help to alleviate these disorders. And I think we wanna stop right here and open it up for questions. Yeah, so these are reference. Um, Kestis, while you're at it, I'll just try to read from the chat. You know, there are some questions that are popping up. Okay. Um, specifically, I think we should um, expand on the findings a little bit more. I know we talked about default mode networks, silence network, front operational network. Ramna, can you actually say what this all means um, in terms of findings, right? Can you just translate it into a layman's term? In terms, of the, uh, in terms of the uh, Samima study? Right, Samima okay. study findings. I yeah. know it's a small study, but what does it really yeah. mean? I can show so, that as well. Um, yeah, so um, should I go ahead and start? Or? Sure. Let's go back to the slides of the findings. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so basically, um, so one of the things when we're looking at the, these kind of findings, so what does it mean? So, um, I mean, some of this is kind of speculative, but uh, basically, you know, we're seeing that uh, when we have an increased connectivity between the salience and default mode networks, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's possible that uh, there could be a better sense of control, um, particularly from the, uh, you know, the anterior cingulate cortex on these other regions, which, um, you know, which, you know, what Kestas was describing earlier about um, suppressing the uh, default mode network. So this could be, this could be a way of, um, you know, strengthening the connection between this could be a way of um, <clears throat> uh, suppressing the default mode network. Whereas like we're seeing in panel B, what we see is a different condition where it's focused breathing. So that itself is a more internalized condition. So um, it's the, um, 
external stimuli are not as needed in, in that particular situation. So the net, you know, the um, the situation is a little more um, internalized. And um, uh, no, Kestis, did you want to uh, expand at all on uh, some of these? So things? part of it could be so salience network. Um, as I mentioned, is also involved in sort of monitoring of internal cues. And we're talking about both the ACC and the anterior insula. Uh, so these are the only two regions in the brain um, that, and that's the salience network that uh, contain the so-called uh, von Ecknamo uh, neurons. Uh, uh, and they they are thought these phonoeconomic neurons are thought to play a role in switching of other networks. So they uh, so it could be that the salience network is monitoring internal cues while either while a person is meditating or uh, even as a developed trait with meditation, and then switching uh, networks. For example, plugging in the frontoparietal executive network to control excessive or <clears throat> um, excessive mind wandering, for example. So that's, I mean, that's one theory of what could be happening here. Right, so I mean, for um, for others to expand on this, you know, what you're trying to say is we have better control over our specific parts of the brain so we can actually have, we can do what we want to do or at least go towards that stage with some MMA, right? So with pre and post, it seems like people uh, compared to the pre states, they had better control in the post states and compared to the control patients, uh, control participants also, they had better states. I know this is a small study. This is a pilot study that's uh, you know given us some insight and probably in a very large data set, we can prove it. So and with the help of Salience Network, you're becoming more aware of the mind wandering states and refocusing yourself into the uh, uh, states that you want to be or action that you want to take, if you will. Is that a right interpretation? Yeah, that, 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 exactly, exactly. So uh, it's actually, it's yes, it's a small study, but it, it sort of agrees with model, with other findings and models by uh, people like David Vega, who's a collaborator of the center, uh, who has a model, similar model. Uh, <laughs> Ramana, can you go to the end of the slides and show, I think, oh, um, this not, well, yeah, this one, this slide. So this is a model by <clears throat> David Vago and Zaidan, uh, recent model, which basically um, posits this, this role. Uh, and I mean, it differs a little bit for open monitoring meditation, focus meditation, but uh, it, um, the idea is the same. Uh, if you focus on the bottom two panels, uh, so the left bottom panel sort of depicts all these networks kind of uh, weakly, not fighting them among themselves, but basically there's sort of a weak control. Uh, whereas the, the bottom right panel uh, with meditation or with meditation, uh, meditation experience, you have you, your frontal parietal control network exerts strong control over these networks aided by uh, the salience network, whose role is, is it, it is to monitor whether you're drifting from the task or, or what have you. It's kind of like going back to the same driving analogy where you're drifting out of the lane. The salience network's network notices that you're drifting and then the frontal parietal, frontal parietal control network takes over and steers you in the right direction. Right. And yeah, so this was published by David Vago in 2016 from Brigham with his collaborator from Brigham, I think. So mind wandering people who do the breath watching from Samima, they also understand that they drift, they refocus, they drift, they refocus, and they, they practice more. And essentially they get uh, the drifting reduces and that's where we are going. And so now we have a uh, you know, an fMRI evidence to show that, you know, what is the reason probably behind this noticing and shifting you back to the focused uh, breathing states. So there are a few more questions here. Um, Hardeep Singh is asking a larger question about what do you think of breaking yogi practices in three groups, Vata, Pitta, and Kapha? I think that is, 
That's a great question, but we will stay away from that question for this particular conversation. It is more about the meditating brain. It's an important question. I'm not trying to ignore that, but uh, we are also trying to see whether we can start doing some precision medicine type of research, categorizing people into these three groups based on SPSR publications and see whether we learn a little bit more about people who were compliant versus non-compliant with those practices. Uh, it is of interest to us, but uh, let's just stay away from that for now. Um, so, so there's I'm, a question from Arun about longer term studies um, yeah. on brain structures. So we're actually currently, Ramana and I and other collaborators are, are involved in such a study where we'll look at these things such as gray matter uh, density and uh, and changes, sort of structural changes in the brains of meditators as, as part of the study on brain age and meditators. Ramana, you want to say more about it or? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, these are, I mean, I guess, uh, yeah, we're looking at studies for the, the, you know, measuring brain age based on, uh, you know, the cortical thickness of, uh, of uh, you know, sorry, the cortical thickness of volu different volumes in the brain. And um, this is something that's actually, it's, um, it's been done in other studies. So uh, it's something that uh, would be very interesting to apply for meditators. And on the whole, what we've seen uh, in the past that, uh, you know, meditation sh um, should decrease brain age by quite a bit. So um, it would be interesting to get some empirical evidence to, uh, to show that. Um, so yeah, I mean, and then- uh, So I, I wanted to uh, chime in a little bit on that. So I think the longitudinal question that he's asking, um, there are multiple layers to that question, if I may um, put in. So one more study that, that Dr. Sepide is trying to put together is when you start from scratch, let's say that you're starting with inner engineering online and then go on to inner engineering completion and then go on. So. They're trying to see whether we can take uh, meditators from the Boston area and maybe other collaborators if possible to see longitudinal changes in brain, both from EEG and fMRI and correlating with neurophysiological uh, questionnaires as well as some blood biomarkers to see how does the uh, brain morphology change, not just the cortical thickness, but also the connectivity, uh, from, just like what was discussed here, brain networks, et cetera along those lines. Regarding the cortical thickness, there has been some work done by Sarah Lazar from MGH and she's published it quite some time ago. So I'm not sure there's anything new there. Um, from our side, I think we wanna see the longitudinal changes at periodic time intervals to go on with it. Regarding the brain age that uh, Ramana and Kest has talked about, we have both EEG and fMRI uh, assessments that we have done, these are cross-sectional just to look at you know what are the changes and reductions in the brain age that is observed with these meditations. So um, let's move on to the other questions that are out there. Uh, is this study published available for reading? Yes, this study is published. Maybe Ramana Tulsi can put that in the chat. Uh, uh, she already did. Oh, she already did. Okay. It's available freely available on in frontiers. Right, and uh, Hina is asking, what are the ways to get involved? So I would like to plug in that there is a Slack group with the Sadhguru Center for a Conscious Planet. We are looking for scientists and uh, people who want to really a take part in the study as a participant, b actually take part in doing the studies, or do the studies in their own locations wherever they are in whichever domains they are strong at. You know, recently there was a work that was published by Dr. Vijay and others from University of Florida, looking at uh, Samyama Genomics. That was published in Proceedings in National Academy of Sciences, which is a prestigious journal. And so we want to uh, you know, support people who are uh, very good in their domains to do the research from the SCCP. We can offer some of the advices regarding the study designs and also how to get it done. So definitely get involved in different ways, right? To uh, Tulsi or uh, Sadhguru Center at um, badmc.harvard.edu. We'll in include you in the Slack conversations. So you'll know the periodic uh, meetings that goes on and also the ways to get involved here. 
So definitely, uh, Hina, I uh, hope that is helpful to answer your questions. Um, how can meditators who have completed some in get involved in any long-term study or planning? So one of the studies that Kestas is leading is to look at um, Medi you know, look at EEG, high density EEG, just such as 6428 channels EEG. Hopefully, you'll get some regulatory approvals to get on with it to study three different kinds, you know, both Shunya, Samyama meditation, both breath watching as well as uh, focus attention. So, we want to see um, cross sectionally as well as longitudinally what are the changes, what are the pathways, can we do some localizations, etc. So, if you're interested in taking part in those studies, please write to Sadhguru Center at badmc.harvard.edu. We are really looking for participants who can, uh, who can, you know, complete the studies. I can't reiterate that enough, and I'm repeating this like a parrot, but uh, we really want people to complete the studies that we are actually taking part in. Otherwise, we end up with a lot of incomplete data, which really hurts us in the long term to publications. We can't really take it to a journal because half the people didn't follow up on the answers and things like that. Uh, anything else you guys are noticing? Sam Chase is asking, is there a known test for FCPN? Um, are you seeing that, uh, Kestis? Like yes, a difficult... yeah, so a typical task that engages uh, the frontal parietal control is uh, the Posner task. And any attention task where you have to keep, sort of keep track of, uh, uh, usually visually, but not necessarily uh, of things and maintain tight attention over several things at the same time. So yeah, that, that is it. the interesting thing about the networks, I, I should say, is that some of them are difficult to separate using tasks, but they're easily separable using um, functional correlation measures and ICA. Um, yep. Right. Um... While other questions are coming in other than contacts and addresses, et cetera, there's some question about, is there a adverse effect that we are noticing long-term follow-ups? Regarding some in my study, um, I think Senthil Sadasana from IU currently in UPMC was the one who led the study, funded the study and uh, did all the IRB regulatory work, et cetera. So he had done long-term follow-up up to six months and uh, we have not seen anything significant to report on any adverse effects. Uh, on the long-term follow-up uh, on that. So I hope Hardy that answers your question. That is the longest that we have followed up these particular participants. Mm -hmm. Kestis, can you elaborate on the depth of meditation itself? Uh, how do you ascertain the depth of meditation using EEG or fMRI? It's, uh, so one measure <clears throat> that is, been fairly well established is is the midfrontal theta power. Uh, another measure we're trying with existing data is um, this brain excitation inhibition, inhibition index called the gamma slope index, which is sort of the the steepness of the power slope um, in the power spectrum of the brain's electrical activity. So what it means is that uh, when you're um, in certain states, for example, deep anesthesia, um, it shifts, um, the, the slow becomes, the gamma band slow becomes steeper. And, and there might be a possibility that same thing or similar thing to a lesser extent happens with deep meditation. So those two, two those are the two measures uh, that we can look at uh, with, with the depth of meditation. Another question that uh, I also wanted to ask you was laterality, right? Um, for example, you talked about the anterior cingulate cortex and the insula, et cetera. In terms of control top down, um, why is the left side as being shown to be the one that dominates for the control? Uh, first of all, is that an assumption? Is that the right assumption? And um, it is there more? On the, sorry, it depends on the modality, I think. Uh, there's not a lot on uh, laterality in meditation, although there is in in, uh, in visual perception and emotion perception and threat perception. So the typical explanation for the left is that if, if it's a verbal, if it's a monitoring task that invo involves language, 
um, that would be typically in most people uh, left lateralized. But in nonverbal tasks, um, there seem to be right lateralization. So typically, um, meditation is, is sort of associated with, with sort of a global, more global processing. And that's a typical right hemisphere function. But there's not a lot that I've been able to find where um, it's heavily lateralized. Um, so I think it depends. There's some indication that the right ACC and the right insula are more important in uh, meditation-related interoception or perception of sort of internal states, which are obviously important in meditation. But there's not uh, a hell of a lot that um, kind of packages it neatly. So. All right, Ramana, if you don't mind stopping to stopping a sharing, there is other question about do all meditators' brain look like look the same versus time, experience, and ability? Um, do all meditators' brains look the same? Is that the question, basically? Yes. Um, no. Um, no. There's definitely differences in um, your meditators' brain and basically every subject. So. This is where kind of like having, you know, a large, the, you know, having large samples is so uh, important uh, because uh, we, uh, you know, if, if like, let's just say if we're able to have like 100 samples, you know, it'll, uh, you know, for each, you know, for each condition, it'll really be able to, uh, uh, to let us average things out, you know, over, over um, a large percentage of people so we can it'll be easier to say that, oh yeah, meditating is the, uh, meditation is the most determinant factor. Um, I, like I wanted to add a little bit um, along these lines, you know, there's not a lot of data that is out there. So you're right in terms of, you know, whether all the meditators may look the same. The largest I have seen is our own scientific advisory board member, Stephen Lars from Belgium had actually looked into one of the Buddhist monks uh, who had had more than 10,000 hours of meditation experience and looked at the brain from uh, his side and actually shown increase in folds and increase in the density of the brain, et cetera, in them. But we don't have large sample sizes. So along those lines, I want to point out that the larger vision for Sadhguru Center at Boston is to create a very large database of um, neuropsychological questionnaires, blood parameters, you know, and imaging tools, that is fMRI or EEG, something along the lines of the Framingham Heart Study. So we need participants uh, when we launch these studies. You know, we are in the process of getting approvals for the the app, which will be specific with the Sadhguru Center. And hopefully, when we get these approvals, regulatory approvals, which are a necessary uh, evil, when we cross that, we all want you to participate in this longitudinal data, so we can get to these kinds of uh, you know questions and answer them in a more objective way. Otherwise, you know, individual's experience is individual's experience. That is ultimate. But we want to add some objectivity to it with all these data that we can slice and dice. This is like a long-term plan. It's you, you can even think of that as a 50, 100 year plan, but we, we, can, we have to start somewhere and we have to build this database and we have to create a very large database that can be used by many, many people to slice and dice as we go on. So look out for these studies when they come whichever way, participate in the studies, you know, also give your thoughts, feedbacks, and nothing can move without, you know, funding and other things. If there are ideas from any one of these people in the chat in, or in the Zoom who can help us to build this center and have more funding to, you know, have this kind of studies, then uh, we are very open. We are all, we have our eyes all, you know, completely eyes and ears open to listen to your feedback. So there's somebody asking, can uh, participants from Europe, oh. Europe and Asia can also participate in building database? Um, I don't know if you're referring to building the database versus actually participating in the database, be a participant in it. There are some regulations. I think Europe has the strictest regulations in terms of data. And so we are looking for partners who are in some university there who can collaborate with us. And so building the database will be much easier in terms of the participants. And so same story goes for Asia. So we need to really come with um, partners who are able to be part of this long-term vision and study. Dr. Bala, there's a question from YouTube, uh, the YouTube live. 
Uh, Lachu V is asking, can you please comment on Samyama's effect on chronic ailments such as diabetes to hypertension, et cetera? What is the neurological impact on these ailments? At least the study that we have completed, I don't think we looked into those questions. So I'll tell you the reason why, you know, this was a very large vision that Santhal and others had at the time in 2018. This itself was taking 30 minutes for people to complete the questionnaires, the number of questionnaires, questions that we asked. And that was considered as a very, um, uh, you know, time uh, consuming uh, research from the participants. So we couldn't do that level of, uh, uh, you know, granularity, like asking about individual uh, diseases and changes in their uh, disease states after Samema. So we're hoping that a Samema will come post-COVID where we can expand on those type of issues um, with the next uh, iteration of the study. We also so have a question uh, from Alka. Sorry, we also had a question from Alka before um, that wasn't yet answered. What is the implication of increased slash decreased connectivity between default and salience network? If possible, please explain with an example. Um, so when we're looking at increased connectivity, um, uh, and then uh, what we, one thing is we can see that, okay, is there like better control? That's, um, that's one thing we're seeing, like, cause um, especially with the anterior singlet cortex, um, does it have better, uh, is the salience network having better control on the, uh, on the um, default mode network? Um, and is this, is this better control on the default mode network, um, you know, showing the results that we see in meditation where uh, we're seeing a certain level of suppression in, uh, you know, DMN, DMN stands for default mode network activity. Um, so that's, um, that's kind of the implication that, uh, that I would, uh, I would see, um, did, um, Estes, did you have any, uh, point of views on that? My sense is that if you are an advanced meditator, uh, you may need less of that, uh, control and less monitoring, uh, you're naturally um staying sort of in your lane and and and, and not mind wandering so that might explain the decreased connectivity between salience and dmn but uh i personally do not have insights except for looking at the data yeah so another thing with this data i wanted to mention is uh it's it, it's really interesting because in the resting state, you saw like an increased uh, connectivity between these networks, but uh, in the focus breathing uh, or breath watching condition, um, within each of these networks, um, there was a decrease in that. So like just the task condition itself, um, you know, it has a, a different uh, a different response within these people. So that's, um, that's really something that I didn't think during the main presentation we highlighted enough, but it's something to really consider that um, just the activity that somebody is or is not doing uh, will also change their response in terms of their uh, connectivity uh, that is required. So I see some other questions there. Who's considered as an advanced meditator? Great question. Uh, you know, the previous question that I asked Esther was, what was, how do you consider or how do you define depth of meditation from imaging tools. So again, something that is evolving as we speak. Similarly, uh, people think that more than 10,000 hours of meditation as somebody with advanced meditation, we all know that how, do, how you do it is more important than the number of hours and duration. So if you ask, you know, when somebody does Shambhavi regularly, the question is, how do you do Shambhavi versus how do you do Shunyans? I think that is much more important than the number of hours we are trying to see how do you define the depth, how do you define the long-term meditation, etc. All of them, as far as I know, they are not well-defined. Um, people are just grossly using number of hours as a way to call somebody as an advanced meditator as of now. If you guys have any insight, please um, mention. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, yeah, it's just a very subjective term at this point, so... Um... I mean, we don't, uh, right. I guess, have a clear. I think definition. we just need, sorry, uh, I think we just need a lot of data where people 
have insights into their own meditation and then we look at their brain activity and try to correlate uh, what that self-report corresponds to. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to add was uh, before the advancement of neuroimaging tools that have exploded in the last 10, 15 years has really paved way for more and more studies. So the last 10, 15 years, you can call it as relatively new and uh, people are, you know, from Europe, US, India, wherever, they're trying to do now more and more of this objective data to expand on the understanding of the meditation. Before that, it was all about neuropsychological questionnaires. Uh, not that it is not important, experience is much more important than the objectivity and we don't even know what we see is actually what the experience that correlation needs to happen. But a um, lot more needs to be done in these areas for sure. Uh, does control group for Samima total non-meditators, no Shambhavi Shunya? So Raman, I want to talk about the control group for uh, Samima study. Um, yeah, sure. Um, uh, what was the, um, was there a specific, what was the They're yeah, just asking question. to define the control group. What was the control group? What have they done? So, yeah, I mean, the control group was mostly, uh, you know, people who are, uh, you know, who are meditators who weren't uh, taking um, who do have some meditation experience, who weren't uh, taking the program. Uh, so um, they, um, they, should, they came for both the uh, pre and post um, scans. So they're recruited, but they're recruited from a pool of people who are, who are doing meditation. They just weren't um, actively, you know, they didn't take the, uh, this particular Samima program. So that's the uh, control group. And um, as mentioned, like, you know, we definitely, if we have future studies, we want to uh, be able to get, uh, you know, uh, a more, first of all, more representative sample in terms of age uh, for the control group, uh, and also uh, get a control group that uh, probably has uh, no meditation experience, or at least somewhere where we can, where we can get a better comparison uh, bef uh, between the meditators and the control groups. Yeah, control group was more like um, uh, household controls, people who can easily participate. And we just used the, that angle much more than anything else and who did not participate in something. That are, those are the only requirements for to be in the control group. Uh, looks like there is no other new question. If there is not, nothing else, we are tosi if we pass the time. Want to yes, give we're, we're just a little over time. Thank you all to, uh, for staying a little over the hour and for all of your wonderful questions from uh, different experiences and your interest in participating in future studies with us. And thank you so much, Drs. Ramana and Kestas for sharing about uh, your research and all of the insights you were able to uncover with us today. Um, I actually just want to share with all of you, we have uh, an upcoming speaker series next month, which is going to highlight uh, another program called Inner Engineering Online and its impacts on positive organizational behavior. And it's specifically looking at the how this program can create a, a better environment and experience in the workplace. And so this will be a really interesting one because it really impacts so many people uh, and it's such an easy program for many people to access as well. And presenting on this topic will be Dr. Tracy Chang, who's an associate mm -hmm. professor at the School of Management at Rus Rutgers University. Um, so I do hope that all of you will be joining us uh, for this event. It's happening on Feb 23rd, uh, which is a Wednesday next month. And the details will be shared to you if you fill out the form that's just sent to you in the chat. And then because you know, so many of you have been part of our journey from the beginning, I wanted to thank every one of you for being part of this community and uh, share a little bit about this past year at Sadhguru Center. We had a really amazing first year. And uh, as you can see from the numbers and this image here, we really launched many research projects and initiated quite a few partnerships and collaborations, uh, including um, 12 publications as well. 
And these include publications on a variety of different programs, including the one that we talked about today and the one that we'll be talking about uh, next month with Dr. Chang as well. And you can see here, if uh, Dr. Bala, did you have anything you wanted to share about these publications? No, go on with uh, Tracy's. Okay. Uh, and uh, Dr. Chang will be sharing about this inner mm -hmm. engineering online program on which he recently published uh, some very interesting work. And in terms of our other kinds of programs that we offer, I know so many of you are interested in the implications on different diseases that these programs and practices can have. And so I wanted to tell you all about our current patient programs, which includes a long COVID recovery program, as well as we're just about to launch a mental health program for those with Parkinson's disease. We also work one-on-one -on -one with patients at our hospital. And we, have, we are soon to launch some upcoming programs for patients and people in these different areas on the right here, including uh, pregnant women, those recovering from cancer, dizzy patients, and those experiencing cognitive neurology disorders. And uh, the best and easiest way for you to stay in touch with us, learn about any new publications, any events and programs coming up is to connect with us on social media. So you can definitely follow Dr. Bala on both Twitter and LinkedIn, and we frequently post about all of our events. So please stay in touch with us and reach out to us anytime through these channels. And finally, if you fill out the form in the chat, we'll be able to connect with you uh, and share more about our programs and events via email. You can always reach out to us via email also at the email shared on the screen, sadhgurucenter at bidmc.harvard.edu. And we look forward to staying connected with you, learning with and from all of you, and seeing you next month for our upcoming speaker series. Thank you all for joining us. Stay well and uh, hope to see you soon. I just wanted to add one last thing is, um, actually, uh, Tracy Chang from Rutgers has done really good work in uh, inner engineering online for college students. And then we had done some work with um, IT professionals and all that work has been published. And there are three or four articles that are coming up in very good journals like um, Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine, then Evidence-Based Complementary Medicine. There's a very good psychology journal in the US. So watch out for these uh, tweets that will come out in the next few weeks. Um, these are all recently accepted and uh, Tracy has spattered at most of these. So if you're going to talk to your college students, universities, etc., now you have actually published article that you can take with you to talk about those. Thank you so much again. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Esther and Ramana.